Okay, um, thanks everybody for coming uh, and being with us. I, uh, Ali, the sound is good. Thanks so much for, for spending this evening together with us. Uh, big apologies to the people downstairs for uh, really, all you all have come from really far. I'm really sorry that we can't accommodate all of you. Uh, but I'm really grateful that you all are here. And I hope you can hear us. Uh, louder. Louder? <laughs> we'll try. <coughs> so uh, this talk actually happened when this, when this book entered the studio. And uh, it's uh, a dear friend and a colleague of mine, Siddharth, who uh, bought the book. And I just saw it. And I said, what is this? And, and he said, Manu's a friend. And I said, what? And then he said, Manu's a 28-year-old. Guy. Nine, nine. Twenty-nine. Right, so. Okay, twenty-nine. <laughs> uh, and like he's uh, written two books, and this is the second book. And I said, "Wow, we have to call him here." And uh, I sent him an email, and within the hour, he replied that you know, yes, I'd love to come. And and we've you know gotten to know each other for the last, I think, two or three weeks, and it's been um, really uh, fascinating to see somebody this young who is uh, so passionate about history and been able to. Manu's blushing here. No, no, I'm just <laughs> amazed by how often young comes up and I'm on the verge of 30, so young is no longer, you know, an everyday possibility. Okay, so I'll just introduce you. Hmm. The way this evening is going to go, we're going to have uh, Manu speak and then uh, a, a moderated conversation with him and, and then a Q&A open to the audience, yeah? Uh, Manu S. Pilla is the author of The Ivory Throne, 2015 and Rebel, Rebel Sultans, 2018 and winner of the Sahitya, Sahitya Academy Yuva Puraskar in 2017. Formerly Chief of Staff to Dr. <laughs> formerly, <coughs> formerly Chief Chief of Staff to Dr. Shashi Tharoor as an MP. Uh, he has in the past worked at the House of Lords in Britain with Lord Karan Billimoria and with the BBC on their Incarnations History series. Written over six years and researched in three continents, Manu's first book, The Ivory Throne, won the 2016 Tata Prize for Best First Work of Nonfiction and the 2017 Sayatya Academy Yuva Puraskar. <laughs> Manu is also text contributor to Serena Chopra's Bhutan Echoes, and writes a weekly column for the Mint Lounge. Manu, by the way, many people said that they read your column and love your column. Which so. is great. <laughs> His other writings have appeared in the Hindu, Open, Open Magazine, The Times of India, Hindustan Times, and other publications. Manu is an alumnus of Ferguson College, Pune, and is currently enrolled as a PhD candidate at King's College in London. He is currently working on his next book. Manu, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Now, we can dim the lights. So, including you here if you want to see. So we begin with this wonderful old man. He's a 103-year-old man who lives in Bangalore, in a, in a colonial bungalow on Richmond Road. And his story is really quite fascinating. About sometime in 1937, when he was about 21 or 22 years old, he was standing on a street in Trivandrum. Now, this is 10 years before independence. So, you know, this is Trivandrum is the capital of the princely state of Travancore. And he's standing there because it's the birthday procession of the senior Maharani's younger daughter. Now, normally when there are these birthday processions, you know, the elephants come out, there are trumpets and there are soldiers and uh, the princesses are carried around in palanquins. So the front, the first palanquin has the, the birthday girl and her older sister follows in a separate palanquin. Now, while he's standing there lounging about on the street, looking at this procession, it passes, the princesses pass by that route. And then the older princess, who's supposed to sit very statuesque and look all pretty in the, in the palanquin, she peeps out of her thing and she sees this man standing there, this 21-year-old, and she decides, ah, that's the man I'm going to marry. <laughs> so then she goes back to the palace where her parents are going through horoscopes and, uh, you know, the biodatas of various members of the aristocracy to find suitable husbands for their daughter. And she says, well, I've already found who I'm going to marry. And they say, no, you can't do that. You can't simply pick a man off the streets and say that I want to marry him. He could be a Christian, he could be lower caste, he could be anybody. But then they made inquiries. It turns out that he belonged to the aristocracy. He came from the family of Raja Ravi Varma, the painter. And uh, the Maharani's father was from that family, so he was also related to them. 
Uh, but then there was still trouble because the cousin of the bride, the princess, he said, look, I'm the Maharaja, I will choose who you marry. She said, absolutely not. If I'm forced against my will, I'll go throw myself off the third floor balcony. Eventually, the British resident came, you know, grand old man in his proper limousine and so on, uh, always with a gun salute every time he came and left. And uh, he came and spoke to the princess and he said, look, are you very sure you want to marry this man? And the princess said, yes, I'm absolutely determined this is the man I'm going to marry. And she repeated her threat, which was, of course, it was an idle threat. She didn't intend to kill herself. And then, uh, before they knew it, in six months, Kerala Varma, who was a BSc science student hoping to marry somebody normal and lead a, a regular career life, became consort to the second princess of Travancore and moved into the palace in Trivandrum where the senior Maharani lived. Now, Sethulman Palace was obviously uh, a unique place for him, even though he was from the aristocracy. He grew up in the countryside. This wasn't uh, a place where there was that much protocol and so on. Whereas the Maharani's palace was all about protocol. So suddenly he arrives and the first thing that he's taught, he's, he's given an appointment with a lady called Miss Watts. Miss Watts is like the social secretary slash former governess to the Maharani's. And she arrives in this big yellow car and she says, now I'm going to train you in etiquette and you know, how to hold your fork and you know, how to cut your food with a knife and all of that. Then they ship him off to Madras to get suits tailored so that he can look presentable. He starts taking riding lessons and that sort of thing. And finally, he has a meeting with a man called the Kakatapoti. Now, Kakatapoti is the hereditary priest of the Travancore royal family. And it's the job of the Kakatapoti to tell him what to do and what not to do in bed with the princess of Travancore. <laughs> because, you see, when it comes to royalty, there was no such thing as privacy. Everything was an act of state. So when they made love, in the first year, it had to be when the stars were aligned and when Venus was in the right place and Saturn was in the wrong place and <laughs> things like that. So that the chances of a good royal heir were at their maximum. So he was told that there are certain things you can do to a princess and there are certain things you cannot expect from a princess. And then, you know, once he got his training, he settled in. For the next 10 years of his life, he lived in the palace with his bride and all, the, all he did was paint, learn music, go out riding because at the end of the day, all he was was consort to the princess of Travancore. Now, the consorts were, in general, uh, a very interesting tribe because you ordinarily you have the patriarchal system across India, which is families where it's man, wife and children. But in the matrilineal system, what happens is that the emphasis is, to put it simplistically, on man, sister and her children. So the man's wife and the woman's husband, they're not members of the family at all. So this is something that existed in my own family. Technically, you know, in, in the old days, my father passed away in January. In the old days, I would not be the one to do the, the funeral rituals. I would not light the pile. His sister's kids would come and do it. When my grandfather died, we actually did have his sister's son come and do it. Because that was the old custom. The, the husbands and wives didn't really have a status. So as he got into this palace, what he saw was a world where there were 300 servants. There were upstairs servants, downstairs servants, inside servants, outside servants. Every time the Maharani came out, you know, there, were, there were certain protocols that had to be followed. And this was a whole new world for him. But the consort status was always inferior. Now, what you see in this picture is a man called Ailyam Tirnal Maharaja. He ruled from 1860 to 1880, so well before Kerala Varma's time. And that is his consort. She was never called the wife. She was always called the consort. And her name was Kalyani Kuti. Now, the consorts are not concubines or mistresses. They are morganatic wives of the Maharajas in the sense that they are legal, they are legitimate, but they have no royal title. So where the Maharaja was, His Highness Shri Padmanabha Dasa Vanchi Pala, uh, Ailyam Dirnal, Rama Varma, Kula Shekhar, Kirita Pati, Manne Sultan, Maharaj, Raj Ram, Raj Bahadur, Shamsher Jang, his wife, <laughs> and I've left out the English titles, his wife was simply Nagar Koil Kalyani Kuti Amichi. And Amichi was usually translated as the mother of His Highness's children. She was not a princess, she was not a Maharani, she was merely the Amichi. Now, as Amichi, there were certain issues. She could not, now you can see this is a photograph taken in a private setting, which is why the Maharaj is appearing the costume that he's chosen, uh, not in a very dignified fashion. But she's obviously made more of an effort. And uh, this is a very private affair, you can see, because normally, as per court protocol, the Maharaja's wife is not meant to be seen with her. She's not a member of the court, she's a private individual, she's his domestic partner who ex exists in a different palace in a different space, and that's her thing. But obviously, there were people who flouted the norms. There were people who were able to uh, break out of that. And the Amitris were not even allowed to be there when their husbands were dying because they came from a caste that was one rung uh, lower on the, on, the, on the hierarchy and the scale. So they couldn't be ar around when the Maharaja was dying. And instead, the final person the Maharaja met was always a Tamil Brahmin who was brought in to embrace the Maharaja, assume all the Maharaja's sins, given 10,000 rupees and thrown out of the state <laughs> to disappear forever. 
But then if this is some sort, so the thing is, if now this guy and this lady didn't have a son, but if they did have a son, I've already recited the string of titles the man had, but the son would always be Mr. Something Tambi. That was all the son's status was. He was aristocracy, but he was never titled beyond that. This existed though for the women as well. Now this lady on the left is the senior Maharani of Travancore in the late 19th century. And that's her husband who's popularly called the Kalidas of Kerala. He was a great Sanskrit scholar. Again, uh, between them, between husband and wife, the Maharani was always superior, which meant that although in private, he may do as he pleased uh, with his wife, in public, he wasn't even allowed to sit in the presence of his wife. He wasn't allowed to call his wife by name. He had to always say, your highness. Uh, you know, there was no question of uh, going and sleeping in the same bedroom. In fact, the, the first image we saw of the princess who picked her husband off the streets, it was she who introduced the innovation of sharing a bedroom, which was considered scandalous at the time, because the consorts had a separate outhouse, and they were only allowed in the royal bedchamber when invited, and when the astrologers said yes. <laughs> but in this case, that did mean affection wasn't there. Actually, there was plenty of affection, there was plenty of love. The, you see a badge that she's wearing here, it's, it's, it's a title, it's a, it's a medal that the, that the Queen of England, Queen Victoria sent her. Because in the 1870s, this man uh, did a very curious thing. He, he started plotting against the Maharaja. As I said, consorts have no place in court. All they were entitled to was 250 rupees a month. All their meals were taken care of and they had the use of a carriage. Other than that, they had no status. So if a consort was in the process of dying, they would lift the court and take it away from the palace because he had no business dying in the palace. He had to die in a private place. His wife and kids would not attend the funeral because even though he was their husband and father, he was still a subject. He was still a private citizen. And royalty does not go to the homes of private citizens. Uh, when there were meals in the palace, the Maharani would be served, this lady would be served four varieties of paisams, dessert. Her husband would get two. Uh, an ordinary guest would get one. Every time she entered and exited the palace, the guards would stand up, you know, present arms, blow the trumpet and play the state anthem. For him, there was only a rifle salute. So in every respect, the husband's status was lower. But in the 1870s, on account of his uh, decision to suddenly start plotting and taking, take part in various intrigues at court, uh, he was sent off by the Maharaja and imprisoned for five years. Now at that time, the Maharaja told his wife, look, why don't you marry another person? I'll suggest somebody. And this wasn't an unusual proposition because, you know, the Maharanis of Travancore could take and discard husbands as they pleased. In the Cochin royal family, for example, they, the women, the princesses always took Nambudri Brahmins as husbands. And the Brahmins were given a monthly salary. And if the princess so chose that, you know, suddenly it wasn't working out, he was given a final amount to sort of uh, take with him and disappear forever and never come back. And, you know, the, as I said, the, the, the kids, it didn't matter who your father was. What mattered was who your maternal uncle was. Now, in this case, the, the reason she ended up with the medal was that when her husband and she were separated on account of his crimes, uh, she decided not to divorce him. She resisted all pressures from the uncle to marry somebody else. And she said, no, I'm devoted to my husband. And then the uncle dies, the fat old uh, Maharaja we saw sitting topless. Uh, when he died, the next Maharaja reunited them. And Queen Victoria was, and you know, Queen Victoria was in love with Prince Albert and she wore black for the rest of her life. And she was all about conjugal devotion and all of that. When she heard the story of this princess in Travancore who refused to let go of her husband, she said, I must give you a medal. And that's how this lady ended up with this, uh, this thing with diamonds and all of that uh, on her chest. Marriage itself was uh, merely called sambandham. Now, sambandham, as you, know, you can immediately translate it, merely means relationship. Now, what does that mean? All a ritual took was the Raja, or a man in general, would present on a tray uh, a white cotton cloth with a piece of red silk. A lamp would be lit. If the lady accepted it, they were married. If she rejected it or threw it out five days later, the marriage was over. So, for example, when my great-great-grandmother got married for the second time, her second husband was already married once. He had a son and he abandoned that wife to come and marry her. She was already married once before. And this is all in the 1880s. And all they did was, now she obviously didn't go out very much. So they opened the door a little bit. All he saw were her hands. He put a cloth into the hand. She accepted it. The door was shut and the marriage was done. So that was the marriage ritual. Now, as I said, the Maharaj, that, that gentleman is Moolam Tirnal Maharaja, who ruled from 1885 to 1924. The dates are irrelevant. But, so this particular gentleman first marries the fat gentleman's daughter, adopted daughter, which is one way of the Maharajas. That's how they secured their, their progeny's futures, which is what your, your sons and daughters don't inherit titles. So what do you do? You get them, your, your daughter married your heir, which is your nephew. So you make sure the cousins end up marrying each other. So then there's some security for your daughter. Now, Again, there was great love and like devotion between the two of these because when this lady died 
uh, in childbirth, the Maharaja was devastated and for the next nearly 20 years he refused to marry, he wouldn't marry. But then something very interesting happened. Now this is the thing, so technically in the matrilineal system the consorts are not supposed to have any influence at all. As I said, they're private. But again, in reality, power worked in a different way. If a consort or a partner could exercise enough influence on a king or a queen, they did end up having much power. So what happened was somewhere uh, towards the 1890s, when it was at least 15, 16 years after this, the lady on the left had passed away, the Maharaja saw the lady on the right, who was evidently a great beauty. And he decided that he wanted to marry this lady. Now there was one complication at the time, which was that the lady was already married. She was the wife of a palace servant called Shankaram Pillai. Now Shankaram Pillai was a regular, you know, clerical sort of character. And Shankaram Pillai, of course, recognized very quickly that this was his passport to prominence. If he gave over his wife to the Maharaja, he would not only get a title, he would also get more power. And they came to an agreement uh, in the late 1890s, where the Maharaja essentially had... Now, she was an ordinary woman. The Maharajas couldn't only marry from a, a certain small set of the aristocracy. So very conveniently, he had that lady adopted into one of the aristo aristocratic families. So suddenly she had a title, she had rank, she had status. And then he espoused her. And then her sister married her ex-husband. And it led to this very complicated situation once in, in the 1910s in court in Madras, where there was a court case going on. And someone said, who was Shankaran Pillai, who by then had got various new titles. And the man replied, the former husband of the Maharaja's present wife, because that was their <laughs> relationship. But. I mean, jokes aside, the point though is that we think often in India that our ancestors are such chaste people, everybody was sitting there with their backs straight and with their dignity on their nose and you know, everyone was perfect. But in reality, the very things that motivate us today existed then as well. So this, this little scandalous affair you saw here, it wasn't scandalous at that time either. It was perfectly normal for a woman to give up another, one husband and take another. It was perfectly part of the, their regular way of life. Uh, you know, the, the previous slide. That gentleman, for example, as I said, in, in textbooks in Kerala, you hear about him as the Kalidas of Kerala, this great Sanskrit scholar and so on. I was completely fascinated because in, I found this 1877 confession letter he wrote from prison, where he says, you know, I've got a list of crimes that I confess to. What are these crimes? Alcohol, marijuana, uh, an, ad uh, an addiction to a, a desire for stronger narcotics, an interest in Christianity and corresponding with journalists. And I, and, and I read the narcotics bit and the marijuana bit and I thought, he was in his late 20s then, he was like kids today, you know, everybody's on their weed or hash or whatever. And it's not such a big deal, he went on to become the Kalidas of Kerala. It doesn't matter, his greatness doesn't get diluted because he also had human flaws. We have a tendency sometimes to elevate historical figures into either heroes and villains and somehow take away their humanity, whereas they actually did have flaws, they were made of flesh and blood. And that is, I think, essential in understanding how they dealt with, uh, you know, power as well. Uh, for instance, you know, often people would say when I was doing my, when I did my first book, why did you reveal all these palace secrets? In fact, I revealed only a small fraction because the records are far more uh, scandalous and explosive. But the reason I ended up what, revealing some things was because power was inherited through the logic of blood. Now, when power is inherited through the logic of blood, the, the boundary between public and private gets blurred. Your private motivations, your private discussions, as I said, that lady's first husband ended up having an influence over this Maharaja, ended up becoming a very corrupt influence behind the throne for about 15, 20 years. Now that, was, that had public repercussions as well. Who, got, who, who became the minister? Who got appointed to various posts? These things were determined by that man. So how can you avoid the truth of this man's reign if you're not going to talk about his peculiar marriage situation where he had you know, this, this borrowed wife from one of his employees? Which now brings me to the main plot in the Ivory Throne, which is now, so that, the, the previous Maharaja ruled till 1924. And then you come to the main story in my first book, which is the story of these two sisters. It's quite a colourful, tragic story. The lady on the right is Setu Lakshmi Bai. She ruled from 1924 till 1931. And the lady on the left is Setu Parvati Bai, who is, as it were, the villain of the piece. Not my words, this is from a British record. Uh, and she ruled for about 17 years till 1949, till the integration of the state, through her son. She was essentially the power behind the throne. So both these women at different times from the 1920s to 1949 held power in their hands. And power was the one thing that really vitiated their own relationship. Now what you see here is 10 year old girls. They were adopted. Now the, the Travancore royal family often ended up running out of heirs. So they had to go back to these distant relatives and keep adopting girls. Never boys, because what's the point? The children don't inherit. So you need girls. And when there were girls born into the family, they would often have, you know, drums and all of that, and nothing for a boy. Uh, so they adopt these two girls, 
and these girls are suddenly you know uh, uprooted from their home their personal homes and installed in the palace where suddenly the senior maharani setu lakshmi bai on the left here she realizes that she's no longer an individual she becomes an institution because from the age of 5 she's become the senior maharani of travancore so every time she enters a room everybody stands up and bows she's got a string of 15 titles which i won't repeat like the last one uh her own father will only refer to her as her highness you know he would never call her by name so she was a very reclusive retiring figure but she ended up being pushed into the limelight because well she had no option her sister on the other hand the junior maharani she was rebellious unorthodox you know anxious for power anxious to go out there to see the world to travel but she was languishing under a title that had junior very prominently attached to it which meant that she had absolutely no scope no place in court protocol and court rituals nothing every time visitors came they went to the sister every time there were banquets uh, the state state banquets it was the senior maharani who was the main figure there every time they needed her uh, uh, the female member of the royal family for rituals it was a retiring senior maharani now this created a little bit of a complicated relationship between them which was further vitiated by their husbands now the now you have to realize that by the uh, early 20th century Victorian ideas had very deeply starting started to set into Kerala society. So suddenly the British were all over the place telling everybody your husbands must matter, consorts must be treated with respect. And you find that the senior maharani was eager to do that because she was reclusive and shy. In a way she gave her husband more power than was customary. She started treating her husband with greater regard that would than was normal. So much so that when she started driving about with her husband in the same carriage, her uncle who we saw in the last slide was horrified because as per the old tradition the the wife and husband the queen and her husband they're not supposed to be seen in the same car if by some accident they end up in the same car he must sit opposite her never next to her because next to her suggested equality and this was a great scandal in trivandrum in 1915 because the senior maharani said i'm a modern woman i should ride and drive with my husband the junior maharani on the other hand she decided no she was going to hold on to the old way she was going to hold on to old tradition and ensure that she treated her husband in the old way which is to keep him standing for example uh, how did they even choose their husbands you know the senior maharani in 1906 she was taken to an upstairs balcony and shown two brothers and she said choose the one you like and then uh, she said look the older one is a little too handsome for me i'll choose the younger one because he's more he looks more diffident and shy as it turned out he de he decided to control his wife and try and seize as much power as possible so he wasn't all that diffident the junior maharani she was offered five boys and she was said, she was again told choose the one you like and she looked at the oldest a man who was 11 years older than her and she said ah that one has a ba degree he's college educated so i'll take him instead of all these other country aristocrats of course the problem was the age became a major issue and by the 1920s their marriage had broken down the they started living separately and that created another scandal there again because of british influence in the old days it would never have been a scandal she could easily have let him go he could have married somebody else and moved on because there was this british influence and they said no 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 marriages are essential your royal family your dignity and this and that she couldn't get out of a, a difficult marriage and she was locked in forever and this lady was also with her diffident husband who actually ended up having a spine she ended up having had uh, having her own complicated marriage as well so the the relationship between these husbands also then got into power because the junior rani rani couldn't stand the fact that her sister was giving so much power to her husband so every time the junior rani visited the senior maharani's palace the senior's husband would go off and go out for a visit or a drive somewhere because she would expect the older one's husband to stand in front of her not stay seated and he said why should i stand in front of the junior maharani i am the husband of the senior maharani so these dynamics start affecting their relationship as sisters and very quickly this has political repercussions she ends up having only two daughters now daughters are essential for the matrilineal system but sons are the ones who inherit actual power so when the previous maharaja dies the junior maharani's sons only about 12 years old so for the next 7 years there's a regency now the right to be a regent goes to the senior maharani so the junior hates the fact that for her son her sister is in power and through her sister her sister's husband complicated then what you see is the now state politics is very communal so you have the nayar party and the brahmins who are very conscious that they're losing their feudal rights land no longer means anything you know the colonial economy means that trade matters you may have acres and acres of land but it will be worth 5 rupees whereas the christians the iravas which was a former low caste they're business people they are earning more and more cash and they're buying off your land so the the senior maharani becomes a champion of the minorities the iravas the syrian christians and those people and the junior maharani she becomes a magnet who attracts the old orthodox elite and very quickly you see a political repercussion of this personal feud between these sisters where political parties also start aligning with one or the other in order to gain you know various things for themselves the book 
beyond the personal drama of their stories. Now, what happens in the end is, uh, sorry, what happens in the end is that, you know, after, by 1931, the senior Maharani's re reign is over, and it's a tragedy that follows. She's harassed by the junior Maharani. She's asked, for example, ornaments in her possession, she has to return. Her incomes and allowances are often delayed. At one point, they take over her ancestral estates. The senior Maharani, she has 15,000 acres of land. The Maharaja says, I'm a man, I shall control this and give you your money, but you won't control it anymore. She resists, she fights, but she loses. The British stand with the Maharaja. Uh, and after independence, independence becomes freedom for her and her daughters as well. And they decide, we're done with being royal, we can't stand this business, no, we don't care about our palaces and 300 servants, and they decide to go off to Bangalore. So this little girl that you see, and the princess who picked the husband of the streets, she's the first one of the family who goes off to Bangalore, uh, decides she's done being a princess, and uh, starts driving her own car, cooking in her own kitchen, she puts her kids in public school. When her mother, the Maharani, comes to Bangalore, she's horrified to discover that her beloved granddaughters are not only carrying backpacks to school, they're crossing the road to go to school. And the Maharani says, no, 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 this is very dangerous, they must go by car. And the Maharani has this old Humber, which is this, you know, stretch limo from the 1930s, and especially made for her, so it had a sofa set inside, and armchairs, and a tea service in the middle, and all of that. And the kids are every day rounded up and put into this car, and they'd go to school like this. And the joke in their family was that when the front of the car was in the school, the back was still in their house, and that's how they went to school. But very quickly, the family adjusted, they gave up their titles. Kerala Varma, who we first saw, in the, in the clip, he became a businessman there. Uh, they became essentially the cream of Bangalore society. And the Maharani's two daughters, the other one went, went to Madras. They never went back to Kerala. All their palaces were taken over by the government. Their, their beach resort beca became a tourist development corporation thing. Uh, their, their summer palace became uh, an, an agricultural college because it had 100 acres and it was next to a lake. So the agricultural university took over. Their main residence where the Maharani raised her children is now a medical research facility. So everything they had went, and they've pretty much become regular folk. I mean, they probably inherited the title of Maharaja at some point. Uh, the Maharani's grandson is the next in line, but the big question is whether they'll bother to go back to Trivandrum and claim it. The junior Maharani, on the other hand, with her strong Hindu credentials, she tried to create a consolidated Hindu community in the 1930s, had a major backlash because the lower caste didn't agree. So they threw open temples for the lower castes, and they you know, tried to create this consolidated Hindu community. In the 1940s, communism comes about, you know, it, it starts to rise in Kerala, this bubble, bubbling starts to turn into a serious issue. By 1947, her divan, Sir C.P. Ramaswamy Iyer, for the first time in 150 years, fires at their own subjects because it's utter chaos. Luckily, independence comes and the, the kingdom and power, these two Maharani's feuded over, the whole thing is wiped out, the, the page is turned and a whole new chapter begins in history. But the senior Maharani suddenly woke up in 1956 and discovered that her own palace servants had formed a union and decided to leave, Bangalore, uh, leave for Bangalore after that. The junior Maharani held on, she died in her palace, she died as a Maharani, she got a state funeral, and her family still lives in Trivandrum. So two very different stories. She got a state funeral, she was cremated in an electric crematorium, surrounded only by family, like any other grandmother you know, you'd see in a regular city, in a regular place. But the book also talks about power, because at the end of the day, one of the things you discover is that power is a very fragile commodity. Any edifice of power that's constructed is a very weak one, which is why kings have to keep reinforcing and pretending that you know, their power is actually real and it exists. So in Travancore, their power came from two things. One was, of course, in the 18th century, this kingdom was created by this Maharaja, who then, then did a very clever thing. He donated or surrendered his kingdom to Sri Padmanabha Swami, which is the deity of the temple, one of the world's richest temples with treasures worth $18 billion and so on. Now, everyone says that this was a very spiritual act by the Maharaja. But we must realize that people in the past were not different from us. Politics was guided by things that, are, that guide politics even today. The Maharaja, when he was giving the, the, the kingdom away to the temple, what was he doing? Very conveniently, as a member of the royal family, said to me in confidence, the deity is in Yoga Nidra, which is this meditative sleep, which mean, meant by giving the kingdom to the deity, the Maharaja could still rule because the deity's eyes were shut. Uh, <laughs> the other thing was, he was a conqueror. He had conquered a number of kingdoms. He had forged it all together. Everywhere he was seen as an invader. So what was, he couldn't get over the fact that the people saw him as an outsider, as a foreigner. So you donated to the, your deity and suddenly, hey, I'm not the one who conquered your kingdoms. These lands belong to the deity. So, you know, if you say anything against me, you're insulting God. And obviously, all these uh, good old Hindu landlords and feudal lords, they all shut up because they realized that now they were insulting God and they were scared of that. So this act of surrender to Padmanabha Swami, by which the kings all became Padmanabha Dasas, was also a strategic or it was a clever device to also corner more power. 
The other thing he realized was that, you know, till then the royal family was first among equals, which basically meant that royal blood was not sacred. So he decides that now I must elevate my family. How do you do that? First, you must acquire a sacred thread. So he realizes now he's a Naya. Now Nayas don't wear sacred threads or whatever. So now he has to become a proper Kshatriya. So they go out and they discover, they, they look for this a cow with all the auspicious symbols and a spot in the right place, the tail shaped the right way, all of that. And they bring this cow to Trivandrum and they construct a golden model of this cow. And it's a huge model in which an entire grown man can fit. The Maharaja goes in through the mouth of the cow in this great ritual called Hiranyagarbha. And uh, he goes into the cow, all the priests around the cow, they start pelting him to flowers and Gomutra or whatever and the other. And they start chanting mantras of birth that are chanted at Brahmin births or whatever. And then the Raja emerges from under the tail of the cow and suddenly he's reborn as you know, descendant of the sun and the moon and Surya Vamshi, Chandra Vamshi, whatever you want. And suddenly he's got a sacred thread, he's allowed to be special. And suddenly the Maharaja's status is elevated. Nobody may touch him, he may only eat food cooked by Brahmins, he can only eat with Brahmins, he's no longer a Naya, he's a special man. The other thing they do is they surround themselves with Naya servants. A 12 volume palace manual is created. So those two girls who were adopted, from the age of five, this 12 volume palace manual was inflicted on them, which told them how they must lie down in bed, what time they must wake up, which side they must get off uh, the bed, uh, you know, things like that. The words that were used for the royal family were, became overly artificial. What was the point? Again, to reinforce that the family is special. So if, I don't know how many Malayalis there are over here, I would say I am not a king, which means I am walking. But with the royal family, you always say, Ernalatta, the royally, you're royally proceeding, you never walk. <laughs> when, you know, when I go for a bath, I'd say I'm going for a kuli. But kings and queens don't go for kuli, they go for palli nirata, which means the royal frolic in water. <laughs> then, every time, every time there's a meal, we call it pakshanam, they call it amrudeta. Amrut means, you know, nectar. They're only having nectar, anything they eat is nectar. When the, when the queen is pregnant, you don't use words like pregnant for a queen. She doesn't do such things as giving birth. You say Teruvayaravanu, which means the royal womb is occupied. <laughs> and, when, and when the queen delivers, the word is Teruvayaravanu, the royal womb is vacated. Because queens do not do disgusting things or you know, bloody things like giving birth. So you know, everything was made to seem like it was special and it was this artificial thing. Uh, when, they, when they died, it was called Nardanigal, to leave for the next kingdom. Because you were ruling this kingdom, now you're going to rule the other kingdom. So, you know, this was constantly re-emphasized to show the people that this family was special. So every time the senior Maharani Setu Lakshmi Bai came down from her first floor bedroom to the ground floor, all the palace guards had to do these special namaskars, top to bottom. And these had to be done not six times, not eight times. It had to be an exact seven, which was the auspicious uh, number. Every member of the royal family had about eight servants attached to them. So uh, the Maharani's granddaughter, when I was interviewing her, she told me that even she, in the 1940s, when she had to go out for a walk, at 4 o'clock all the princesses would go out for walks. And she would have these patakas, I, I don't think you see it here. There are these household guards with their you know, turbans and silver hangings and the crest and all of that. So there'd be two in front, two on either side and two behind. So there'd be eight people surrounding this girl. There'd be a main maid holding up a silk parasol. And then there are these eight servants attached to her. So all the eight servants would be following like this. So for this one eight-year-old girl, girl to go for a walk, there'd be 16 people following her. <laughs> Again, what was this about? Reinforcing the idea that the girl was special. Everything she did, her walk in the garden had to be a ritual. Everything was about protocol. When the Maharani uh, went out on her drives, it, was never at a very, but it wasn't at a particularly fast speed that her car moved because the car was also surrounded by outriders on horses and these footmen on the, on the boards on the side because that's how queens moved about. If she went on a long drive, there'd be a pilot car, you know. Every time she moved from one palace to the other, the guards would go first, set up their places, all of which was emphasizing to the people, we are special, we are special, because power at the end of the day can slip through your fingers very quickly. It's not merely about how much power you control in terms of arms, it's also about the ideology. And this is something we see today as well. Public relations matters. You know, this was essentially at the end of the day public relations. When the king calls himself, himself Padmana Vadasa, it's public relations. He's taking away his personal name and he's calling himself vice regent of God on earth. When the queen goes out with such fanfare, she's making a statement. Much like our rulers even today, they realize that you have to put out ads, you have to put out your face, your name, re-emphasize the idea that you are special. And that's something the Travancore family was very good at. Uh, now, obviously, Travancore existed in the colonial system. So you have this system where they've established their Sanskritic court rituals, they've established, they've surrounded themselves with Brahmins. There are 24 cooks in the kitchen, for example. The, the Maharani's always served 15 items. She may not even eat it, but 15 items have to be there. So there are all these rituals that are established. 
And that, the thing in the center is the ivory throne that the Maharajas of Travancore built in the 19th century for themselves, but they ended up constantly sitting on this much older 18th century ivory throne. And this is where the reality of power and the actual dynamics with the British come into the picture. Now this man, Martanda Varma, was a Maharaja in the mid-19th century. He died in 1860. And he was a little bit of a modernizer as he saw it. So while he weighed himself in gold and con condu conducted all the temple festivals, at the same time he also dressed in European suits. And he liked to perform Kathakali. Now everybody told him that kings can't perform on stage. It's unbecoming of kings. So he performed in front of a mirror. Now he wanted... <laughs> He was also a doctor, an amateur doctor, so he'd you know, have a dispensary in the palace and uh, provide medicines to the poor and so on. Um, he wanted a grander throne constructed for himself, so he built this one in the middle. Now in 1849, when work is underway on this one, and it's a very interesting one where you have lions and elephants and the conch, which are Kerala elements, but you also have the dragon and the unicorn from the British, uh, the, the royal coat of arms of the UK. Um, so he constructs this one for himself, and that's when news arrives from London that Prince Philip is organizing what would become the Great Exhibition of 1851, send the prized products of Travancore to be exhibited. Now when Queen Victoria sends you a, a summons and a command like this, you can't ignore it. So the poor Maharaja, the throne he's constructed for himself, he's to pack it up and ship it off to Queen Victoria for her to use it as, and it's very interesting, she never refers, it to, refers to it as a throne, she always calls it my magnificent chair or my splendid chair. Again, power dynamics, which is that what was a throne to him is for her only a chair. Which is why all the Maharajas in India, their kingdoms were never called kingdoms, they were called princely states. Because there was only one king, and that was the king of England. You were all princes. You know, none of you, only the senior prince and the Mah senior Maharani would have the title of highness. None of the junior members of the family were formerly highnesses. So the British also tried and emphasized this distinction between them, where a throne becomes a chair to them, even though it's a throne for the actual maker of it. So this poor man ended up sending it there to her and in 18, she was clearly, clearly pleased with it because in 1877 when Queen Victoria proclaimed herself Empress of India as in succession to the Mughals, she chose to have her official photograph taken on this exact ivory throne. And the irony is that the Maharajas of Travancore who said all this to their subjects and had all this elaborate court protocol in Kerala, their favoured favorite throne was shipped off and now sits in Windsor Castle which tells you a lot about the dynamics the British had with them. Now, Travancore was also called a modern progressive state. How did, how did progress come about? Every time the Raja conducted a festival, the British resident would appear saying, no, 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 too expensive, spend it on road work, spend it on this. Uh, missionaries, you know, they come and saying that there are caste abuses, you must rectify this. So slowly the power of the Maharajas in actual terms was, I don't know, it, was, it started narrowing down into a very small area where they, they had autonomy in other places, they had to listen to the British resident. Which is why their emphasis on ritual and custom became even higher, because that's the only thing they had to look like Maharajas. Now, socially, the other thing the book touches upon is breasts. Now, in the 19th century, a major conundrum Kerala started facing was the issue of women and their breasts. Because in Kerala, toplessness was the norm. Whether you were a Brahmin woman, whether you were a low caste woman, nobody covered themselves above the waist. Now, suddenly from the 19th century, you have these Englishmen coming in saying, Women, you know, you must cover yourselves. They sort of bring this patriarchal gaze, the sexualizing of the breast started happening. And suddenly women, as you see in the picture on the right, which is a princess of the Cochin royal family, when they started sitting for photographs and paintings, they started covering up like this. The women of Travancore were, went one step forward because they considered themselves more modern and they started actually wearing the blouse. The irony is that till the 1940s, most women in Kerala did not wear blouses and to wear a blouse was considered supremely indecent. So, for instance, if you felt the need to wear a blouse, then you, there was something wrong with you. You were a slut. So there's this famous story by Aubrey Menon, where his mother, who's an Irish woman, she's come off, she's married to her Malayali husband and brought to Kerala. And the mother-in-law, who's this grand Malayali dame, says, I wish to see my daughter-in-law. So the maid runs off to the outhouse to bring this Firang daughter-in-law in. And she comes running back saying, Are you, you know, your daughter-in-law sitting there, she's wearing a dress, she's covered herself up. And the mother-in-law says, if she's covering herself, she must be preparing for adultery. Because only <laughs> public women, only low caste, or you know, Mlecha Muslims and Christians wore blouses. Upper caste Hindu women never wore blouses. So in the 1860s, under British pressure, the Maharaja of Travancore told all his female servants, you must all start wearing blouses. The women had no option but to comply, but the moment they got out of the palace gate, they'd get rid of it. In, you know, after the book came out, I went to Cochin, and a member of the Cochin royal family told me about a social reformer in Thrissur who said, I am going to, I'm a modernizer, I'm a man of the future, I'm going to take out a procession of women in blouses. And then, you know, this, such a massive crowd gathered there because they were like, women in blouses, what a sight. <laughs> and then all these women started parading themselves in blouses. 
<laughs> except that the crowd was so large that the women weren't expecting such a large crowd and they got very self-conscious midway and they threw off their blouses and ran away. <laughs> so you have these very weird things happening in Kerala at the time. In the 1920s, the first Brahmin woman to wear a blouse was excommunicated by the Brahmin community. Among the Brahmins, even men wearing shirts was considered completely uh, out of the norm. It wasn't permitted first and you know, it was considered brushed. You lost caste if you did such things. And the Victorians came in and they said, no, women must cover up. Women. The other thing they did is the matrilineal system slowly started breaking down. Because what happens is, the irony is Setu Lakshmi Bai, the, the protagonist of the book, so much for a woman who inherited power because of the matrilineal system, she was the one who formally abolished it. Because the pressure grew to such an extent. See, all these, the sons of women like this, they were all going off to study in colleges and madras and so on. Where their, their classmates, these ayers and ayangars, you know, all these patriarchal men would taunt them saying, ah, your mothers don't wear blouses. You know, they've got three, three husbands because Malayali women could be polyandrous if they so chose. So, you know, a woman could have more than one husband. Uh, the word we use for father now actually means my lord. Achan means my lord. It's not the actual word for father. Because back in the day, kids, it didn't matter who your father was. The joke was that, you know, you ask a Malayali man the name of his father, you, he, he rarely has an idea because it's the uncle that matters. Now suddenly these men go out to college and they come back with these ideas saying, we will, you know, make our women chaste. They must start wearing blouses. And these Malayali women's magazines start coming in. So Kerala today has very high social development indices. We've got great education systems and so on. But while modern education was given to women, women started going to school from the early 20th century onwards and literacy grew, it was through that very education system that patriarchy also slowly made its way into Kerala society. So the first women's magazines very openly said, we will not publish anything related to politics. We will not publish anything related to economy. We will publish only things that energize the moral conscience, which is what? Wear a blouse. Don't have more than one husband. Take care of your husband, take care of your kids, let your husband handle all your money and property, you know, you, why do you even need property? These were the messages that were being reinforced in 20th century Kerala. And the, the, the breast became a major issue there. And I remember my grandmother telling me about her mother, the first time she wore a blouse, she was very embarrassed to come out of the house for 10 days because she felt very self-conscious wearing a blouse and walking out. And that was Kerala at the time. Now today you go to a place like Shabrimala where there's this great scandal going on about whether women should be let in. And there are these rows and rows of men out to protect custom and tradition. And you know, it's quite funny because if you give them an actual taste of some of the traditions of Kerala, I wonder if they'll rise with the same amount of fervor to protect them <laughs> and insist that we discard the blouse and we start giving the women the right to have three husbands and then all of that again, which of course won't happen. So <laughs> custom and tradition is never timeless. These things always change with time. With Shabrimala also, it was the junior Maharani's son in the 19, late 1930s, in 1936, he's the one who allowed Dalits to enter temples, for example. Now, at the time, the same arguments that are being used in Shabrimala against women, these were all trotted out then. If you bring in uh, Dalits, we have nothing against Dalits, but the sanctity of the idol will be, uh, you know, it will be tainted. Now, this is the same thing they're saying about women. We have nothing against women, but if women come in, that's the way the idol is consecrated, it won't like it, etc., etc. The arguments are pretty much the same. <coughs> Now, this brings me to a broader question. Now, all of what I've said is about this sliver of land right here in the lower corner of this map. And this little sliver alone has such fascinating history. There's the matrilineal system, topless women. There were queens in the 17th century who, you know, the British came out once to negotiate a trade treaty with the king of Koilon, only to realize that the king of Koilon was a topless queen. And, you know, the, the Rani of Artingal, the ancestress of the Travancore queens, she used to lead 15,000 lead 15, men into battle, again topless, with a sword in her hand and riding a horse. They were, they were warrior queens. One of the earliest uh, enclaves the British had in India was given by a queen, not by a king. And that, this, this completely unusual system which we don't learn about in our textbooks, none of that, that existed just a minor little piece of land on this uh, west coast of Kerala. As you go further up the map, you find that all sorts of places are fascinating stories. In Rajputana, for example, in the late 19th century, there was this Maharaja, very colorful man. All the British were going around him saying that Zenanas are bad, you know, these are dark, shady places where these concubines and these eunuchs and your queens are all intriguing and plotting against the state because it, that was the one place the British could not penetrate. They weren't allowed into the Zenana. The Maharaja said, well, I'll give you a taste of the Zenana. And he took a camera and then started creating portraits of his Zenana women. And they're fascinating portraits. And this tells you a lot about an Indian version of modernity. There's, a, there's another Maharaja in, 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 in Rajputana who decided he wanted to go to Europe. Now, in those days, crossing the Kalapani is sin. And the first people to cross, in, ironically, were Devdasis in the early 19th century who went out and performed for the king of the, the French uh, around 1830-something. 
And of course, you have Raja Ramon Roy and all of those people. But for a Maharaja to go out, he's a proper Hindu defender of the faith and all of that. So what does he do? Not only does he carry huge ass urns of uh, Ganga water with him, so that every time he goes, you know, he's got Ganga water to purify him. Not only does he carry cows and other things, his Brahmin cooks and so on. He also puts Indian soil into his chapels, into his into his shoes, so that technically he's on Indian soil even when he's abroad. <laughs> so Indians were very good at flouting these norms, these customs that we had. And that's again just Rajputana. You go up further north into different parts of the country, you find all kinds of colourful, fascinating stories. And you know, in India, we're often taught one monochromatic version of history, which is the politics of history. We're not taught that the map of India as we see it today is often a result of various historical accidents. So the, the British, for example, wanted to connect Manipur and Assam, and they decided, hold on, we've got these two territories, the only thing in the middle is a bunch of hills, so we're going to go through these hills and construct a new road. So they go through the hills and suddenly the Naga tribes wake up and say, hey, who the hell are you? And then the British say, hi, now we own your lands. And the Naga started fighting the British then, in the 19th century. They fought them all the way till 1947. And after that, they've been fighting the Indian state. That's why we have an insurgency there. So the idea is they never acknowledged British supremacy to begin with. They still don't acknowledge fully the supremacy of the Indian state. To them, everybody is an outsider. So Indian modernity, the way history actually happened is slightly more complicated than the grand narratives we are given of 4,000 year civilization, this linear progression to our perfect democratic existence today. There is no perfect, there is no linear progression. It's always a series of accidents, complex layered things that happen to somehow fit into various situations and that's how it happens. All the Himalayan kingdoms, for example, Leh Ladakh had its own ruler, then you have the ruler of Tibet, Sikkim, Bhutan, these formed a belt, a cultural ecosystem of their own. Now, you know, Tibet obviously belongs somewhere else, Sikkim will be annexed eventually, Bhutan is an independent country, and there's no king in Leh. Now, we think Leh is an integral part of India, but it actually exists in a different cultural ecosystem earlier. This isn't making a value judgment saying this is good or bad, that's just how it was, and we need to have the, the maturity to be able to look at history in its proper light. Now, the other politics in Indian history is that it, there's a huge emphasis on the North. Everything we learn in India is very North-centric, it's very Delhi and the rest. So we, for all the Mughal emperors we learn about, and they deserve their place in history, they were important figures, we never, for example, learn about the Vijayanagar emperors. Now the Vijayanagar emperors ruled one of the world's greatest cities of the time. They had trade relations with Persia, they sent out ambassadors to China as early as the 14th century. Their cities were, you know, among, as I said, the biggest in the world. Again, they, get, they end up getting the short end of the stick. We like to believe that Ahimsa is our national creed, it's always been the case. But as Upinder Singh's book on political violence in India shows, you know, Ahimsa was, wasn't really a part of our creed. Violence was very much a part of Indian history. And this, again, is one of those things where people don't realize that we now, in a democratic system, have the luxury of saying violence is bad. Back in the day, violence and power went hand in hand. If you wanted power, you had to exercise violence. And this wasn't the monopoly of kings of any one religion alone. All kings had to do it, everybody had to do it, that's just how it was. So this is why, so I began my, my, my researches first with the story of my, with the land of my ancestors and very quickly moved up to the Deccan because this is where I was raised, in Pune. So this is the, this, my second book was a tribute to the land where I was raised. And that brings me to the history of the Deccan, where I'll just read out uh, the opening section of the book just to send, uh, give you a, a sort of flavour of the book itself as well as, you know, what I'm trying to convey through it. Histories of the Deccan often begin with the story of Shivaji, but in this book Shivaji appears only at the end. In 1630, when the Maratha noblewoman Jijabai brought forth the second of her two sons, little did she imagine that the boy would grow up to shatter forever the might of the Mughal Empire. But the Deccan into which Shivaji arrived was already a fascinating place, populated by remarkable men and women who all claimed for themselves the esteem of posterity. In that very century, for instance, it had seen the daughter of an African slave become queen to a local potentate, cheerfully conspiring to murder a more favoured Persian wife. A few decades later, in another corner of the plateau, an ill-fated Brahmin minister carried favour with Aurangzeb, delivering to that emperor cartloads of mangoes while plotting covertly to thwart His Majesty's imperial designs. The Deccan was the land where a Muslim prince warded off hysterical interventions by the orthodoxy when it was discovered that he exalted Hindu gods over the teachings of the Prophet. Saints and divines too solicited their share in this world of fortune, worshippers of Shiva descending every year upon a celebrated Muslim shrine. There were splendid palaces with golden thrones and forbidding fortresses with thunderous guns. Fine horses bred in Iraq trotted along the Deccan's roads, even as the region's elites succumbed to the sartorial fancies of their friends in Iran. 
Travelers from lands as diverse as Burma and France descended upon the Deccan's dusty plains, while its harems bewildered European doctors who encountered begums with skin as pale as their own. The Deccan to the world was uniquely Indian. To India, however, it was a mirror of the world. Now, the reason I say this is because, again, we like to think first there were the Gupta, first there were the Vedas, then there were the Harappans, then there were the Guptas, and then the Muslims came, they did very many bad things. Then the Hindus fought back, then the British came, they did very many bad things. And then finally, we landed in this wonderful democratic age with our wonderful constitution and so on. But Indian history, again, is not a one source civilization. It has sources that come from various places, and that's true of most places around the world. It's not peculiar to India alone. One of the reasons we chose this as the cover of the book was because even though it's a simple painting, it seems to convey in many ways what the Deccan is all about. The elephant essentially is that quintessential Indian animal. It's, it's always recognized as an Indian emblem. So you have the elephant that these two men are riding. The man in the front is the Adil Shah of Bijapur, which is now in Karnataka. And the man at the back is his attendant, or his courtier, Iklas Khan. And what's interesting is they're riding and they, or they rule over this Indian territory. The Adil Shah of Bijapur, now technically if you look at these Hindu-Muslim narratives, the Adil Shah, what is he? He's a, a Muslim ruler over a, over a Hindu mass and therefore equal to evil. But in reality, the ancestor of the Adil Shah, the first of the Adil Shahs, got on a boat from Persia. He was coming to India to seek his fortune. Somewhere on the way, now this is like the boat Brahmins, you know, when the British sent off, sent off indentured labor to the Trinidad and Tobago Islands, for example. On the way on the boat, various people would upgrade their castes. They would decide, Acha, here, in, here I'm a Dalit, tomorrow by the time I land in Trinidad, I'm going to be a Brahmin. <laughs> so, you know, because that gave you the opportunity to transcend various socially uh, you know, imposed categories and boundaries. Now, this man's ancestor lands, he claims while he lands in the Deccan that he is the long lost son of a, the Ottoman Emperor. Now, his life was in danger from a brother, so his mother shipped him off with a loyal merchant and he was raised by the merchant or whatever, and that's his little fancy backstory. Of course, he was just a regular mercenary. Some say he actually came from Georgia, so you know, he was possibly even European, had some European blood. He marries then a Maratha woman. So right from day one, the Adil Shahs are not merely a Muslim Persian dynasty, they are also a mix of Maratha blood. And you find that since then, all the Adil Shahs that ruled, they tended to flip between their Maratha and their Persian identity. So Yusuf Adil Shah's son, the second Adil Shah, he was all about Persian. So his clothes were Persian, he spoke Persian, he dressed all his army men and his servants in Persian clothes, and he was always sort of sucking up to the Shah of Iran. But then you have an, a, later, a later Adil Shah who's all about his Maratha heritage, who's all about Hinduism, who's all about Hindu culture, we'll come to him. And the Maratha woman who founded the dynasty with the, with the ancestor of the Adil Shahs, it wasn't like she was some sort of uh, pawn in a political game. Even if she began like that, handed over to a Muslim soldier, uh, she was also a political actor. So two generations later, when a legitimate grandson isn't up to the mark and is not capable of ruling as Adil Shah, she has absolutely no issues blinding him and putting him away and having an illegitimate grandson installed as the Adil Shah. Again, violence was all over the place. This is a Maratha Hindu woman, but for the security of the state, for, the, for, the, for holding on to power for their dynasty, she goes ahead and does what needs to be done. So the Adil Shahs who are sitting on this elephant, they're this part Maratha, part uh, Persian dynasty. The man at the back is an African. Now, this is the other thing. Growing up in Pune, our textbooks had... See, Mar Maharashtrian history or the Deccan history is dominated by Shivaji. You know, at, at the most, it's about the feud between Shivaji and Aurangzeb. And Shivaji, of course, deserves his place in history. He was a towering figure. He did very many great things, which is fine. But these guys have therefore tended to languish in the footnotes. They've sort of been marginalized. In the story of Shivaji, they make these fleeting appearances. They, they sort of at the margins. They, they don't really have much of a say. Whereas in reality, the stage onto which Shivaji marched with such pride and confidence was established and built by these people. And we don't realize growing up in Pune that, you know, in Ahmednagar, for example, where the Nizam Shahs ruled, there were at least two sultans who had black queens, African wives. You know, there were sultans in Ahmednagar, which is now a tier two town in India. There were African queens who existed at one time, something we don't know. We don't know that thousands of Africans came to the Deccan, you know, year after year after year, they'd get off ships and become mercenaries. So the Deccan was in many ways a mirror of the world because Persians came here, Ottoman artillerymen came here, people from Europe came here, Renaissance artists came here, and so on. The Deccan also complicates this whole issue of Hindu versus Muslim. So this is a, a miniature painting that shows the Battle of Talikota. Now the Battle of Talikota is always trotted out by Twitter trolls uh, you know, who, who have a great say these days in, in shaping the general uh, public idea of history. Saying that, you know, Battle of Talikota, all these Sultanates of the Deccan, the Adil Shahs of Bijapur, Nizam Shahs of Ahmednagar, and the Qutub Shahs of Golconda, these Muslims come together and they destroy this Hindu empire of Vijayanagar. Now, it's a very black and white scenario. 
But in reality, things are a little more complicated. Because at the Battle of Talikota, there were 6,000 Hindu Marathas fighting, but they were fighting for the Sultans. On the side of the Vijayanagar Emperor, there was a man called Ainur Mul Gilani, whose name, as you can imagine, from his name you can expect, he was a Muslim. The only uh, record of Ainur Mul Gilani is where he's giving a grant of land to 80 Brahmins. So clearly he wasn't too much of a, a jihadi Muslim or whatever as Twitter trolls would like you to believe. At the Battle of Talikota, against the Vijayanagar Emperor, was the Qutub Shah of Golconda, who had spent seven years of his youth growing up in Golconda, where he not only in, in, in Vijayanagar, where he not only picked up the Telugu language, he fell in love with the uh, local woman, a Telugu woman, who he took back and made her his queen. He fell in love with the Mahabharata, so he patronized Telugu poetry on the Mahabharata. Um, there was also at the same battle the Adil Shah of Bijapur. The Adil Shah of Bijapur, as it happened, was the adopted son of the Vijayanagar Emperor. Only a few years later, earlier, when they were on good terms, the Vijayanagar Emperor had happily adopted him as a son after his biological son died. The Vijayanagar Emperor himself, the de facto Vijayanagar Emperor Ramaraya, he himself had begun his career in the court of the Qutub Shah of Golconda. And the Nizam Shah who was present, who was perhaps the most violent of the lot, he was descended from a converted Brahmin. So he was a Sunni Muslim of Brahmin descent. The Adil Shahs of Persian Marathas. The Qutub Shahs were the only ones who had proper Shia descent from various places, but even they had Telugu women coming and marrying into the family. And this was the Battle of Talikota with Marathas fighting for the Muslims and Muslims fighting for the Hindus and so on. And in the corner there, you see a man with a white parasol. So after the Emperor of Vijayanagar's court, you can see his uh, headless body over there in the center. Qutub Shah is actually telling the Nizam Shah, who's on the horse, spare his life. Don't execute him. We won the battle. We won this war. Let him be. Because even despite, I mean, although they were fighting, this wasn't a clash of religions. They had their dynamics. These were constantly shifting dynamics. At one point, Vijayanagar may ally with two sultans to destroy the third sultan. At one point, that third sultan may come back and ally with Vijayanagar against another rival. As politics, I mean, there were, am I saying there were no bigots in those days? Of course, there were bigots. Then as now, religion did animate bigots. It did energize uh, notions of religious superiority. And that is, and there's no de denying that. But actual politics, what determined decisions that kings took was not my faith. Like you didn't wake up in the morning saying, I'm a Muslim, I'm going to go kill all the Muslims, all, all the Hindus there. You find these bombastic texts. Now this is again thrown at me often on Twitter, where someone will take a screenshot from Google Books saying, so and so text says, look, uh, this Sultan claims himself that he destroyed 20,000 Hindus every day. Now the thing is, you can either take text at face value or you can look at it as a historian which is never take anything at face value. A text, when a text is presented to a historian, you have to interrogate the text itself. What language is the text written in? Who is the intended audience of the text and what is it trying to achieve? So in the uh, early, in the, in the late uh, 14th century, the Vijayanagar emperors go to Madurai and they kick out the sultans of Madurai. And then there's this Madura Vijayam, a Sanskrit poem that's written in which it says, oh, the blood of Brahmins was flowing in the streets, cows were slaughtered and their blood had reddened uh, the river and so on. Now obviously this is an expression of Sanskritic Hinduism. Of course, this is that. But is it entirely telling you the truth? Now, the text is written in Sanskrit. So is it addressing a lay audience, the common man on the ground? It's not. It's addressing the local Madurai elite, the Brahmins of Madurai, the local elites. Who's, who's written the text? Who's authored this Madura Vijay? It's a princess of the Vijayanagar royal family. So she's got a little bit of a, a foot in this game. She's not an objective uh, you know, poet who's writing separately. She's got some sort of an agenda here. And what is the text trying to achieve? By making the sultans of Madurai look more alien, the Vijayanagar emperors are making, the, making themselves look less alien. Because Tamilians had their own emperors, the Pandyas, the Cholas and so on. And Vijayanagar was a Telugu Kannada enterprise that was coming in to rule them. So Vijayanagar was also technically alien. It wasn't a, a completely local thing. So you play up your local, your, your, your common Sanskritic ideals and you make the other enemy look more foreign. You're trying to achieve a political end. Similarly, when sultans boast, you know, Mahmud of Ghori, for example, said, you know, he'd, he'd write these Arabic and Persian texts or commission them saying he destroyed so many infidels and so on. These were all written in Persian and Arabic for the Islamic world to the west of India. These were not for Indian audiences who didn't know Persian and Arabic. In reality, to rule those Indian audiences, he had to mint coins with Lakshmi's image nicely inscribed on it because that's the only way people recognized coins. So on the one hand, he's saying, I'm destroying all these infidels. On the other hand, he's got an infidel goddess on his coins because the truth is a little more complex. It's like... I mean, I, I won't name the party, but there's a certain party that says beef is bad. Now, that's their official line. But in the Northeast, they say, no, no, you eat all the beef you want. They go to Kerala and say, no, we'll never ban beef here. Because if you want to win votes in these places, you have to tailor your political message to the local people. Your official ideology, your official statement is one thing. 
how that actually manifests in everyday politics is something else. It's a little bit like our constitution also, one of the most wondrous documents in the world. Wonderful guarantees, abolished untouchability, but untouchability is right here. It's not gone anywhere. So you, you always find that, like today, even in the past, there were these bombastic statements, but it didn't actually reflect lived reality on the ground, which is always much more complex. For example, now look at this. This is Krishna Devaraya. This is the famous uh, series of bronzes that he donated to the Tirupati temple in, uh, in, in the south. And it's still there. Now, of course, the, the priests don't seem to like these topless women, so they've covered them up in saris and all of that. <laughs> but what they haven't covered up is Krishna Devaraya's head. If you look closely, he's essentially wearing a Turkish hat. Now, this is Krishna Devaraya, the emperor of a Hindu empire, wearing a Persianate costume. Of course, Vijayanagar was a Hindu empire because it articulated its sense of power in a Sanskritic ideology. The Muslims had their Persianized Arabic or Islamic ideology. These guys had their Sanskritic ideology. But all the same, that did not preclude absorbing Western sartorial tastes, as I was saying. The women of Vijayanagar used to wear these conical hats with gems and jewels sort of embroidered into it. Now, when you, know, you look at these badly made period serials and so on on Indian television, and they have absolutely nothing to show for the actual costumes these people wore. Where do you see conical hats on, on Indian women in the past? You don't, but that's how they actually dressed. So, and the Turkish hat is only one Persian influence that you actually see in Vijayanagar. Now, if you go to Hampi, the ruins, the oldest part you see in the sculptures, the men are all wearing the South Indian Veshti, the, the, the Munda. But as time passes, as the centuries pass, you see more and more Islamic influences coming in. Suddenly, you have tunics appear. Suddenly, in the, you go to the Vitala temple in Vijayanagar, where there's a column that shows an Arab on a horse. Now imagine telling a present-day ultra right-wing person that in a Hindu temple you have an Arab nicely enshrined on a pillar. It, it won't really sell very nicely. But that's how it was. The architecture of Vijayanagar, domes were not an Indian tradition. These were again borrowed from the West. And just as Vijayanagar also exported. So the Bahmani sultans of the Deccan, one of them married a Vijayanagar princess. And as part of her dowry, he demanded 2,000 cultural professionals, dancers, poets, musicians, because they wanted to consciously import uh, Vijayanagar, or South Indian culture, into uh, their court culture as well. So on the one hand, there are these massive exchanges happening. But of course, officially, their ideologies are different. So when they have to wage war, the ideologies come out. You pull out your book, open a page saying, ah, jihad. You pull out a book saying, defender of Hinduism. In reality, the Vijayanagar emperors kept a Quran in their court. And they didn't, you know, because their uh, Muslim noblemen couldn't bow to a, an infidel king. So they kept a Quran next to the king. So technically, the man was bowing to the Quran, not to the king. So people in the past found ways to deal with this. Often you find that Indians negotiated complicated historical situations through the invention of legend and tradition. One of my favorite stories is about the Srirangam temple, where if you go, you'll find a Muslim deity in the temple called Tuluka Nachiar, which literally translates as Muslim princess. Tuluka is essentially Turuska, which is Turk, equal to Muslim. So what is a Muslim princess doing in a Hindu temple? Legend has it, as per the temple chronicles, that uh, when the Muslims came and invaded the Srirangam temple, they took away the idol of the god and went back to Delhi. Now, one local woman, whose name is then, uh, she's later called Pin, Pin Todarnavalli, which means she who followed. She follows the armies of the, of the Sultan of Delhi, goes all the way to Delhi, marches alone, and goes there. She finds out where the idol's gone, comes back all the way to Srirangam and tells the priests, look, I know where the idol is, come with me. So all the Srirangam priests, again, next procession heads off to Delhi. They go there, and then they dance for the king, entertain him, and the king says, wah, wah, I'll give you one boon. And then they say, we want our idol back. King says, fine, go fetch the idol from the store. Now, when his servants go to the store and they find the idol missing, where's the idol gone? It turns out the Sultan's daughter had gone and picked up the idol and she had kept it in her bedroom and she was playing with it as though it was a doll. And the chronicles very mischievously add a line saying that in the evening the idol would come to life and play games with the sister. Now, you wonder what, uh, with the doll, with the princess, so you wonder what that is. And then, now the thing is, there isn't, there's also an imp, there's also something that they're sort of giving us, I mean, it's an infer inference really, which is that by worshipping the deity or by dressing the deity, bathing him, feeding him like a doll, she's actually doing bhakti, like bhakti worship, she's worshipping him like a Hindu. So when the princess goes to sleep, the idol says, okay, I'll come back with my priest back to my temple. Princess wakes up, she's distraught, she says, where is my beloved doll, my you know, friend? And she starts giving chase to these Brahmin priests from Sri Ranga. The Brahmin priests decide, look, we've got to split up our group, one set hide the idol somewhere, the other set will go back to Sri Ranga. Princess follows the Sri Rangam set, comes there, discovers that her lord is not there and dies in Viraha, or the pangs of separation, at the temple. The exact same legend also exists in the Melkote temple, which is in uh, Karnataka. Except the difference there is that the, in one temple, the princess is enshrined in a wall as a painting. In the other, she's actually got a shrine. Same legend applying to two different stories. 
And what is this legend trying to do? It's actually trying to locate the Muslim in the worldview of the orthodox Hindu. So even today, when in the Sri Rangam temple, when the deity is taken out for his daily um, uh, round of the temple, the procession, when it comes to the place where Tulukanacha's wall painting is, the deities take a, a colorful lungi is tied around the deity because the lungi is the mark of the South Indian Muslim and he's fed North Indian prasadam of chapati and things like that. All of this is trying to create some sort of a bridge. Just as you know what Richard H. Davis calls the uh, songs of resistance that the Hindus created. So the story of Padmavati that was so much in the news last year. Now there was no historical figure called Padmavati as far as we know. She exists, she first we hear of her is 200 years later in a poem written ironically by a Muslim. And in this poem, a parrot flies all the way from Sri Lanka to Rajputana, tells the prince there's this princess in Sri Lanka, he goes to Sri Lanka, fetches her from there. So it's a little bit of an unlikely scenario. But the idea is again by playing up the idea that they resisted, that she chose death over uh, the harem of the Sultan. And this particular Sultan, Alauddin Khilji, actually did seize a Hindu queen, which was Kamla of Gujarat, not Padmavati. And Kamla then after marrying him said, Acha, bring my daughter also. So then he went sent another army to bring her daughter as well. But the idea is these legends, these songs, at the, on the one hand, they're emphasizing difference. They're saying, look, you're Hindu, we're Muslim. On the other hand, they're also trying to create conversational spaces. So even with someone like Eknath, the local uh, Bhakti saint, in his Baruds, you have these Hindu-Muslim conversations, just as you have a Brahmin-Dalit conversation. At the time, for a Brahmin, a Dalit is not more alien than a Muslim. They're both equally alien. A Brahmin will not let a Dalit come near him, neither will he let a Muslim come near him. So there's no consolidated Hindu identity where all the Hindus are waking up in the morning saying, we are Hindus, you are Muslims. That's not what it is. Because on the ground, things were much more syncretic. There was much more of an exchange. You go to Shabrimala, as I said, you know, one of the first shrines you pay your uh, respects in is for Vavar Swami. And Vavar is a Muslim whose name sounds almost annoyingly close to some as Babar. You know, that's what Vavar essentially is. Now again, was there a real Vavar? Was he a god? No, he wasn't probably. He was probably a local mercenary or something. But again, it's trying to locate or give a place to the Muslim in that local tradition. In Kerala, in my own ancestral home and in all temples, all the ghee that came in needed to be touched and purified by a Syrian Christian. So any ghee and oil that went into a Hindu temple needed a Syrian Christian to touch it first. You find the oldest mosques in Kerala, they don't have domes and minarets, they constructed like Hindu temples. Uh, you know, when Vasco da Gama landed, he ended up going into a Kali temple thinking it was a chapel to the Madonna because, you know, uh, chapels to the Madonna did look like Kali temples. You couldn't quite tell the difference. And when he came and told all the Christians, your churches belong to the Pope, they said, who the hell is the Pope? Because they were <laughs> Eastern Orthodox and they were not Roman Catholics. So again, religion is one of those places where there's a lot more, it's a lot more complicated. It's not an either or situation. Was there an identity as Hindus? Yes, because in 1347, you find the Vijayanagar emperors, the first uh, dynasty, the Sangama brothers, for the first time inventing a title that says Hindu Raya Surathrana. What is the translation? Sultan among Hindu kings. On the, on the one hand, they're ab absorbing or appropriating the title Sultan for themselves, Surathrana. On the other hand, they're also saying we are Hindus. Hindu Raya Surathrana. We are Sultans, but you're Muslim Sultans, we're Hindu Sultans. So they want to be Sultans, but they're also saying there's a distinction between us. All the same, as I said, costume, coat culture, a massive difference. Now the man on the right is one of the Adil Shahs. Ali Adil Shah, he's the one who was uh, part of the uh, defeat of Vijayanagar in uh, 1565. Ironically, uh, also a very colorful man, he ate uh, 12 eggs for breakfast every day. <laughs> he, uh, you know, eventually fell in love uh, with two eunuchs and then one day he invited them to his bedchamber only to realize uh, quite tragically that they did not reciprocate his romantic feelings. Instead, they stabbed him and killed him. <laughs> so that was the end of Ali Adil Shah's life. As I said, violence was all over the place. But Ali Adil Shah was also the man who either sponsored or himself wrote this wonderful text called Nujum al Ulum, where you have these fascinating illustrations like this, which are angels, but they all have the heads of cows. Now this is, I mean, we haven't quite understood how to interpret this, because either the cows are some sort of homage to Hindu tradition, so you've got cow-headed angels, but the Nujum is full of lots of other things. On the one hand, it will tell you about how to identify men and women on their modes of sitting. So based on your sitting, you can classify people. It's got these things like Varshik astrology, which is you don't find anywhere else. This is the only text that talks about such a thing as Varshik astrology. It's got the most obscure Hindu goddesses in it. Chubhapagi, Chalandhari, you know, these very tantric goddesses. And this is a Muslim Sultan who's actually written all of this, or at least commissioned the writing of all of this. His successor, Ibrahim Adil Shah II, who's perhaps the most favorite of, uh, of the uh, Adil Shahs of Bijapur, he, of course, called himself son of Saraswati and Ganapati. Now, he's a Sunni Muslim but calls himself son of Saraswati and Ganapati. He was so besotted with Saraswati that he at one point named his capital Vidyapur because Saraswati is the goddess of Vidya. He uh, 
had a fascinating quote where, you know, once a, a gem trader came there and discovered that the Adil Shah surrounded by 500 pl women playing Venus, again, a very South Indian instrument, uh, play, Veena playing 500 women, all of them wearing these disc-like earrings and full of costumes and jewellery. And he tells a Renaissance artist, come paint for me. And suddenly you find Christian elements coming to Bijapur art, where suddenly the, the costumes of the women, they, 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 they're like gowns. The drapery is like gowns. You see hats starting to appear in Bijapur paintings. And Ibra uh, Ibrahim Adil Shah II was also a very interesting diplomat. Now, first, for the longest time, he didn't like the Mughals coming into the Deccan. For them, in the early 1600s, he realized, look, the Mughals are more powerful, so we'll have to come to some arrangement with them. So they signed a treaty saying, look, uh, I will now give you a daughter into the Mughal harem. Now, Ibrahim is very clever. When the Mughal envoy arrives to sort of discuss the trade treaty, the man starts bribing him. Gives him so much money that for three or four years, the ambassador doesn't do anything, just sits there. And there's no bride to be had to take back to Delhi, to Agra. So then finally, Akbar, who's in power, then gets very frustrated. And he says, I'm sending a second ambassador. Gives one clear instruction to the ambassador that you will not spend more than one night in Bijapur. But Ibrahim is even more clever. Ibrahim, the moment the man is about two weeks away, Ibrahim says, I've got busy business. I can't receive you at court just now, so stay there for a while. The man says, what the hell, you know, I'm supposed to come to your capital. Ibrahim says, no, no, I'll entertain you. He starts sending poets and dancers and biryani. So suddenly, like, this man's <laughs> camp is full of huge ass vessels that, you know, the, he can't use because the man's sort of bombarding him with food and conversationalists and all kinds of people. Finally, the man says, look, whether you like it or not, I'm coming to Bijapur. So he comes. Ibrahim tries his best to keep the man there for more than one night. Tries to bribe him, nothing works. Finally, at their parting uh, sort of meeting, Ibrahim says, okay, here's my daughter. Oh, by the way, what's this badger wedding? Now, this particular ambassador was, uh, was part of Akbar's Dini Elahi. They all wore a special badge. And Ibrahim says, okay, may I have a look at it? So the man gives it to him. And Ibrahim says, okay, bye. Now I'm taking this and walking <laughs> off. So the man says, look, he can't leave without his Dini Elahi badge. But he has to leave within one night. He can't stay longer than a night. So the man then leaves Bijapur, sets up camp outside Bijapur. And then for the next two weeks, there's this constant run of couriers between the two, uh, from camp to palace, where basically he's like, give me my Dini Elahi badge back. And Ibrahim says, no, no, I'm still studying it. I want to keep it. I'm feeling like I'm, I'm part of the community as well. Can't you get another one? So there's this big charade being played out. Finally, nothing works. He gives it to him. The Mughal party starts off, only for the princess then to try and escape and run back to her father. She's caught on the way, dragged to the banks of the Godavari, and she's given to Prince Daniel as his wife. That's how the first Bijapur princess ends up in the Mughal harem. Uh, and also, among the, among the other things that Ibrahim sent to Agra was um, tobacco. So, you know, that's where you find this fascinating uh, court chronicle where Akbar's talking about his first smoke. And then Jahangir, of course, gets quite addicted to tobacco as well. But coming back to Ibrahim's religious uh, sentiments, this is his Saraswati. Now, normally you have Saraswati in Indian sculptures, which is a certain kind of Saraswati, and you have the Raja Ravi Varma kind of Saraswati. Ibrahim's is, as you can see, a very Islamic Saraswati. She, is, she looks like a Muslim princess more than a traditional Hindu goddess. And this was something that was peculiar to Deccan miniatures, which is that they took ideas from various places, but Deccanized them or Persianized them in very interesting ways. So she's got the Veena, there's the conch, there's the lotus, all of Saraswati's usual uh, symbols and emblems, but she doesn't look like your conventional Saraswati. Coming back to the Africans. Now, the Africans have played a role in Indian history that is hugely understudied. As early as the 13th century, when Razia Sultan was uh, the empress or the queen of Delhi, one of the reasons they wanted to kill her and eventually succeeded was because she was in a romantic relationship with an African. I mean, some say the romance was invented to justify her murder, but the point is she was very close to an Abyssinian. This is Iklas Khan, one of the Bijapur nobles. You see him there grandly on a horse and so on. He, like all the other Africans who came to the Deccan, came here as a slave, as a military slave. However, in the Deccan, they could easily rise to, height, to the heights of prominence and achieve great power. Now, uh, Africans, even before in the Deccan, I don't know how many Bengalis know it, in the late 15th century, there was a short-lived African dynasty that ruled in Bengal. In, uh, in, in the Uttar Pradesh, in a place called Jaunpur, for nearly a century, there was an African dynasty that ruled, a bunch of Habshis, founded by a eunuch, which obviously was inherited then by his nephew, and that they had a nearly one century long rule in Uttar Pradesh. How many people in Uttar Pradesh know this? So, you know, the Africans were a very colorful and integral part of, of Deccan history. And Malik Ambar on the left here is, among the Africans, the most interesting and flamboyant. He comes to the Deccan sometime in the late... In the, in the 1570s, or 1560s perhaps, as a young man, he was enslaved uh, from his Oromo tribe, dragged off somewhere to Baghdad. From there, he was sold to somebody who shipped him to the Deccan, where in the Deccan, he was purchased by the Peshwa of the uh, Nizam Shahs. Now, the Peshwa of the Nizam Shahs himself an African man who had come here earlier as a slave and risen to become minister. 
Over the years, uh, he obtains his freedom after the Peshwa dies, becomes a mercenary, has his own force. And then when the Mughals finally start their siege of Ahmednagar, where the famous Chand Bibi is leading the resistance and so on, and the Deccan slowly starts folding before Mughal power, he discovers that there's a little vacuum there where he can make, he can make his own presence felt. He can start to grow in influence. So from 3,000, his army doubles to 7,000, and so it increases. And he gets his daughter married to a... So one Nizam Shah, the Mughals take off and imprison somewhere in the north. He discovers a long-lost cousin of the Nizam Shah. says, now you're the new Nizam Shah. I will support you. Marries his daughter. And for the next 25 years, this African man, who was enslaved from Ethiopia and dragged all the way to the Deccan, he's the main obstacle that stands between the Mughals and the conquest of the Deccan. Again, when there are all these wonderful stories about Shivaji and his resistance of Mughal power, but exactly two, two generations before Shivaji, and Shivaji's grandfather was a close associate of Malikambar's, Maluji. It, Malikambar was the man. And Af just I mean, picture the scene, an African warlord with Maratha noblemen standing up against the might of the Mughal emperor with an alliance with Bijapur and all these other places. Jahangir was so, in fact, frustrated with Malikambar's obduracy and refusal to give in to Mughal power that he fantasized in art what he could never achieve in real life, which was shooting an arrow at Malikambar's uh, <laughs> severed head. Malikambar, of course, died at the, in a, in a, in a, at a grand old age of 80-something, secure in a fortress, secure in his power, absolutely not at the end of any Mughal emperor's arrow. Uh, and, and such was. But the Mughals were so frustrated with them because he was the one man who stood uh, in the middle. Whoops. Now, I don't know, I don't know what this may look to you like. Now, if you go to Bijapur or to Ahmednagar, you'd see all these Islamic tombs, right? And this is something where the controversial scholar James Lane went and he described these as tombs. But they're not actually tombs. They look like Islamic structures. Again, uh, going back to my earlier point about Islamic influence on Hindus as well, these are the samadhis of Shivaji's grandfather and his family. This is where Shivaji's grandfather, Maluji, was cremated. But because Persian architectural styles were so integral to the aristocracy and their own projection of power, this is how they constructed them. So as James Lane called them tombs, but they're not actually tombs because there's no body buried inside. It is a Hindu samadhi that looks very much like a Muslim tomb. Um, look at the costumes that the that the you know the Marathas also wore. I and mean, these are not exactly the same, but the Maratha costume, you know what Shivaji wore, which comes in a later in a later uh, portrait. These are actually Persian costumes. You know, look at the clothes they're wearing. These are not local Indian costumes. These are Persian styles they're wearing. The turban, the, the way the kurta is shaped, all of this is Persian. Look at the titles that the court used. You know, the Mahapuna was the capital of the Peshwas. Peshwa is a Persian word. The chief minister of Maharashtra today is Devendra Fadnavis. Fadnavis is a Persian word. Maharashtrian surnames like Daftar Dar, you know, the Chitnis, these are all derived from various Persian words. Because Persian influence is very, very, very strong in the Deccan. Now, Shivaji comes into the picture at a very interesting period. Malik Ambar's died. Malik Ambar's son's not very capable. Shivaji's father, Shahji, who interestingly, uh, Shahji's brother's name was Sharifji, and he and his brother were named after a Muslim called Shah Sharif. The parents, Maloji and his wife, couldn't have kids for a long time. So they sent off, they went and met this Sufi called Shah Sharif. And when they then had sons, they named one Shahji, the other Sharifji. Again, it slightly complicates your idea of Shivaji as this growing up in this ultra Hindu sort of uh, setup. So Shivaji, of course, however, did articulate a Hindu vision. He consciously said, I will now discard Persian as the language of court. Now, Persian in India had a very important place. Till the 1830s, it was the language of diplomacy. So when the Maharani of Travancore, even in the 1810s, wrote a letter to the East India Company governor in Madras, it was in Persian, not in English. It was in Persian, because Persian was the language of diplomacy. Shivaji, however, said, no, I'm going to emphasize Sanskrit. I'm going to emphasize Hindu uh, traditions. He started writing to Rajputs in uh, Sanskrit because he said, why should we use these overvalued Yavana words? We're going to start using this. He commissioned uh, a court poem uh, called the Shiva Bharata. Now, Shiva Bharata on the one hand says he's Vishnu reborn to sort of rid the world of the Mlechas, which is the Muslims. But the same Shiva Bharata also refers to a Nizam Shah of Ahmednagar as a Dharmatma. The same Shiva Bharata, where he says that all these Muslims are coming and destroying our lands, he also says that Malik Ambar was as brave as the sun, and Malik Ambar is a Muslim. And you know, he compares Malik Ambar to Kartikeya, the Hindu god, surrounded by his other gods, you know, defeating the Asuras. That's how Malik Ambar is presented, where the Marathas are surrounding Malik Ambar and supporting him. Uh, so, you know, even while he articulated a Sanskritic court tradition, Shivaji did not ignore, or could not ignore, his court poet could not ignore the court traditions or the real uh, lie of the land, where the Marathas and their connection with the Sultans was very strong. So, at one time, Shivaji was trying to win over uh, a Maratha family, and they said, no, we've eaten the salt of the Sultans, we can't come over to you now. And Shivaji says, 
True, but we now have a greater loyalty which is to our God. So he names a Bhavani and he says that, you know, this is our Goddess and this is higher than any uh, obligation you have to a mortal. It's interesting because he is again articulating a Hindu vision, a Hindavi Swaraj, a Hindavi kingdom. But all the same, he kept, so you know, when Afzal, Sa, Shah, uh, Afzal Khan comes to murder Shivaji and Shivaji ends up killing him, the people marching with Afzal Shah, the names in the Shiva Bharata, Ghorpade, Ghatke, these are Maharashtra and Maratha names. And on Shivaji's side, you have Siddhi Ibrahim, which is a Muslim name. So again, they had their respective ideologies. But, I mean, on the way, Afzal Khan even sacked a temple, uh, which was the Pandarpur temple. Now, why would you sack temples? Sultans and kings would not sack every temple that lay on their route to an enemy capital. They would sack temples which were of essence to the legitimacy of that dynasty. So when Tipu Sultan invaded Kerala, he made a statement that I would go to Trivandrum and tie my horse on the flagstaff of the Sri Padmanabha Swami temple. He didn't say any other temple on the way. He wanted the Padmanabha Swami temple because the legitimacy of the Travancore Maharaja's Padmanabha Dasas came from that. When they demolished temples, it was usually to demolish legitimacy. Just as the Vijayanagar emperors, when they conquered or went into Deccan Sultanate territories, they used to destroy mosques, especially those mosques that were constructed by uh, specific sultans as marks of their legitimacy. So Shivaji was articulating a new vision. He was creating something new. But it wasn't, again, the black and white thing that we see often today. So, in fact, very soon, soon after Shivaji died, Persian came back. Because as the Peshwas expanded Maratha power across Hindustan or northern India, they realized that Persian was the language of diplomacy. Now, if you want to talk to a Bengali uh, you know, subordinate somewhere on the margins of Bengal, you have to do it in Persian because you have no other common language. It has to be Persian. So Persian came back. Persian influences came back. Costume existed. And the Marathas, this is the funny thing, the Marathas became the real force in northern India, but they never displaced the Mughal emperor. They always said that we are defenders of the Mughal emperor's throne. Of course, it was all about legitimacy. Why didn't the British displace the Mughal emperor till 1858? Because they got stamps of approval from the Mughal Emperor. They could do precisely what they pleased, but the Mughal Emperor was a very good legitimizing figure. And, that was a, and he was essential to the Marathas as well. They needed the Mughal Emperor as well. If this was a Hindu versus Muslim, uh, this thing, they would never have allowed a Mughal to stay. They would have conquered Delhi and taken over. But then they would not have won the loyalty of lots of other people. The, everybody, you know, Rajput versus Marathas, they have their own rivalries. But both of them recognize the supremacy of the Mughals. It's a little bit like the Congress party today, where you know, there are plenty of leaders in the party, but none of them will get along with each other, none of them will accept each other. So you have one family on top, because everyone accepts them. And that's fine, because power works that way. At the end of the day, power is about how many factions you can bring together. And the Marathas realized that very quickly. So, I mean, I end the book with the, you know, talking about all these Sultans, Khilji to Shivaji, this, you know, the, the coming of the Muslims, their interaction with Hindus, how Hinduism in, influenced local Islam, and finally ends with Shivaji, who now uh, articulates a new ideology of state. What is interesting, though, of course, is that in all this talk about sultans, there is one major gap, which is where are the women? And this is something that sadly is a tragedy of Indian history, which is that it is truly his story, because there are very few women whose stories are told. Women were not in positions of power where they could record their contributions. And in some cases, when they did record their contributions, they were actually expunged. So if you look carefully at this painting, this is Hussein Nizam Shah, who was at the Battle of Talikota, um, died within months of, the, of winning that battle. And his son was a minor, so his Begum, Kunza Humayun, who was a Persian lady, she became the regent of uh, Ahmednagar for her son. Her son hated this. For six years, he sort of chafed under his mother. Finally, there was a coup with a bunch of noblemen, and uh, the Kunza Humayun, the mother, was pushed out. And one of the first things the son did was, not only did, her wipe, did he wipe her out of records, he also painted over her in miniatures. So look closely next to Hussein Nizam Shah, and you see a little, what used to be a figure, which has now been turned into a bolster and just like the shape at the back. And this is done to various miniature paintings. For example, in one, she appeared sitting in his lap. Now, this is not normal for a Begum to be shown in a miniature painting sitting in anybody's lap. But, you know, there's the, the Ahmednagar court was a very interesting place. There's one work that Hussein Nizam Shah commissioned in which Kunza Humayun's breasts are compared to ripe pomegranates and things like that. So they were much more open about these things. But the son couldn't stand his mother's rule at all. So he not only wiped out the record, he also painted over her in history. The other, but then, you know, the problem is, this is her daughter Chan Bibi. When the Mughals came, she's the one who led the resistance in Ahmednagar against the Mughals. But at the end of the day, uh, she was stabbed in the back and murdered by her own courtiers. So while the enemy was at the gates, hammering away, trying to enter, her own men stabbed her in the back and took away her, took away her life. It was something that was such a tragedy at the time that even the Mughals remembered Chan Bibi. Because she tried, died in tragedy, her story had some sort of recall value. It had some sort of romantic value. 
Her mother, Kunza Humayun, on the other hand, she was a woman who didn't die at the end of a sword in some grand battle. She wanted power like a normal human being. Just because she was a woman and just because she exercised it on a daily basis, the men did not want to turn her into a heroine. They wanted to paint her over, forget her, and she didn't die in battle in some glorious way. She rotted away in a prison after many years, dying as a nobody. So for her, there are no poets, there are no storytellers. This is how women have often ended up getting the short end of the stick. This is how, for example, even with my first book, you know, I, I, my protagonist and my antagonist are both uh, these women. And you know, one of the things that I was at least very invested in was the fact that my villain and my hero, and they're both women. You know, they're both strong female figures. It's a matrilineal system. This is something we're not used to at all. Where are the women in Indian history? Why aren't their voices heard? Now, luckily, more and more women are writing history. There's Parvati Sharma, who's coming on the 24th. There's Ira Mukoti, who's written about Mughal women. And, you know, their contributions are not minor. Mughal Begums, you know, in the early phase, there were no harems as such. They were always on the move in various camps. And often to negotiate, say, an, uh, a, a treaty between, if, if two cousins are fighting, if the king's in power and some rebellious cousin exists, it would be a Begum who'd go out as a diplomat and mollify the guy and say, come back, you know, I'll guarantee your life. Humayun, you know, lost his daughter at a battle because women didn't sit in the palaces. They accompanied their husbands to battle. And one time in one of Humayun's battles, there was such confusion that one of his six-year-old daughters ended up drowning. So the women were there. They were part of history. They were part, their stories were being told. In the Mughal case, for example, Akbar comes and creates a new harem system. And you find that early women, they have names. Uh, you know, Kunza Humayun, for example, Gulbadan Begum, Akbar's mother, they all have proper names. But from Akbar's time, their individual identities are taken away. They become titles. Mumtaz Mahal, you know, Noor Jahan, these are all titles. Their personality hides behind or is hidden behind these grand titles that are invented to sort of seclude them, not only from, you know, public view, as it were, but also from public imagination. The women became hidden behind the parda. Even then, of course, Noor Jahan exercised plenty of uh, influence, but it's also, it also tells you a lot about how women were, at the end of the day, not allowed a chance, even though they were active players in history, even though they were active players in politics, their stories haven't been told enough. So I tried to rectify that with my first book. I tried to address that somewhat in the second book. The further back you go in time, the, 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 the material is, is even more slender. So it becomes a little more complicated than that. But one hopes that you know, more people will come in, more stories will be told, and more stories that are outside of this linear narrative of Indian history, where everything is about Delhi, everything is about one set of empires, or one set of leaders. The princely states, they're fascinating experiments in modernity. You know, think of Sarfoji of Tanjavur, this man who imports, he's a proper Maratha ruler in Tamil country. He imports Western science, gets a local Christian subordinate, a Tamil, to turn them into Tamil songs, and that's how they teach geometry and arithmetic and Western science to kids in Tanjaur, because that's how they, you know, did it. So there was, there was plenty in the princely states as well that was actually of great value, where they tried to marry modernity to an Indian uh, version of it. They didn't want to, you know, sort of borrow Western modernity and apply it top down. They wanted to Indianize it and use it for their own purposes. These stories are not told. Women are not told. Lower caste stories are not told. And some stories, I mean, again, Indian history is not merely boredom and, as I said, dignified people sitting straight like you see in some period films where everyone's got their back all proper and they all speak in these wonderful poetic dialogues. That's not how it worked. Since I mentioned Tanjavur, I'll end on a final anecdote from there. The, in the early 18th century, there was a Maratha king called Shahu in Tanjavur. Now, we think that you know, in India, multiculturalism or uh, diversity is a very new phenomenon, unity and diversity and all of that. But even then, in this Maratha court in Tanjavur, you have a Maratha king whose court language is Telugu. His army is manned by Afghans and Bundelas and Rajputs, and his subjects are all Tamils. Now, that's the situation. This is in the early 18th century. And he patronizes, uh, or he writes a poem called the Sati Dana Suramu in Telugu, which is a fascinating parody of caste system. Now, what do we think that in the past everybody upheld the caste system, nobody challenged it? Not true, because here he's lampooning the Brahmins for inventing the caste system, essentially. The story has one Brahmin called Moro Batlu, the Magnificent, who's on the way to a pilgrim or to a temple festival. And on the way, he sees a beautiful woman. And he says, oh, my God, hold on, forget the festival, let's look at this ravishing beauty. And now it turns out this ravishing beauty is an Okas Dalit woman. Now, she's a married woman. She turns around and says, why are you giving me this sort of attention? He says, no, you know, forget all the Shastras. I've got my eyes on you. And this Dalit woman is the one who turns around and says, Shastra, Dharma, Artha, Karma, and all of this to him. So again, already Shahu's turned the caste system a little bit to have this Dalit woman telling this man that, you know, he should focus on the, on the scriptures. And he, whereas he's besotted and he says, oh, you know, give me your loins like you give a Brahmin land. And these are the kind of dialogues that exist in, uh, in this 18th century poem. 
which is again a mark that Indian history is much richer than we think. For every highbrow philosophical thing that you know they, they elucidated and put out there and had these great debates about, there were also people who had fun. There were also people who laughed at each other. In the 18th century, again, uh, in, in, in Tanjaur, there was a poet, there was a courtesan called Muddupalni who wrote one of the most fascinating and most colorful works of erotica at the time. And this is interesting because this is, it's called Radhika Santhwanam, the appeasement of Radha, where Radha is getting her niece, uh, Ila, married to uh, Krishna. So she told, tells Ila, you know, now he'll, he'll claw at you, you should bear it, and this is how you must make love to Krishna and all of that. But the moment she delivers Ila to the bridal bedchamber, Radha returns and she's in the pangs of jealousy. She says, you know, till yesterday I was Krishna's main person. And now there's a woman who's with a body as soft as bananas and she's going to displace me and take my place and all of that. And Radha is very upset and angry and she can't sleep and all of that. And Krishna comes back to her. That's why it's the appeasement of Radha. He comes back and he tells her, look, no, your place is secure. You're always special for me and all of that. Again, Mudupalni adds a little twist here where Krishna eventually starts complaining that he can't quite sashi uh, satiate Radha's appetites. Because he says, even when I'm tired and I say I can't make love, she jumps on and begins the game of love. <laughs> these are the kind of dialogues. These are the kind. And the thing is, you know, it's not merely about these things being funny or interesting. It's also the fact that our ancestors had the security and the confidence to say these things without feeling like they were somehow inferior for it. Today, you know, people who want to be custodians of tradition, they don't want to look at all of this. You know, th this is like the two Shakuntalas who exist. Everybody, today we have Kalidasa Shakuntala, who's the main Shakuntala everybody identifies. This coy woman who gets, you know, the king forgets there's a ring. He sees the ring and that's when he wakes up and realizes that there was a curse and all of that. But the original Shakuntala in the epics is not like that. In the original Shakuntala story, when Dushyanta comes to the thing, he says, lie with me, oh buxom woman. And then Shakuntala says, sure, but my son from you must then be heir. So she immediately says, this will have repercussions. She's not a woman who's silent and scared to talk to him and needs her maids to talk to him or any of that. She's very forthright and direct. When she takes her son to the court, in the original story, Dushanta deliberately lies. Because he says, you know, oh, if I admit in front of my court that this woman is telling the truth, you know, any woman can show up tomorrow. So he deliberately lies. And she doesn't cry and disappear. She stands up and she says, whether or not you acknowledge my son, he will rule the earth. I fly the skies. You're merely a mortal king. So she's capable of speaking back to him. She's somebody who has her way in the original epic. But again, when the British come to India and they start translating Kalidasa's Shakuntala, so William Jones is horrified by some of the sentences he reads in it. So there's one section where Shakuntala is described as, oh, her face was down, for, uh, crest fallen, her shoulders were drooping and her breasts were sagging. And William Jones was so embarrassed about the breasts, he included the drooping shoulders and the face in his translation, but forgot all about the breasts because he didn't want to scandalize his audience back home. And we have absorbed that version of our past. We have absorbed this Victorianized, sanitized, not sanitized, that's the wrong word, but a Victorianized sort of truncated or a somewhat reduced, basicalized version of our history, whereas things were much more rich, much more open to ideas, open to innovation, open to creativity, and open to plenty of humor. So, you know, on that note, I think I'll end. I've spoken for quite a while. Khrushchev given me 60 minutes. I'm not sure what time it is. Uh, and now I think we have questions.